Um, this webinar is on um, the classical economists. Uh, this webinar is part of a series where we introduce different schools of thoughts in economics. And this week, we're very lucky to have Gonzalo Fonseca uh, introduce um, classical economists in a little bit of detail uh, or more detail than we have um, had so far. Gonzalo is a research fellow at the New Economic, um, the Institute for New Economic Thinking. His research focuses on a history of economic thought and economic theory, and he's behind the very brilliant website, hatwebsite.net, and I'm gonna paste the link in the chat for you to check it out afterwards. It's amazing, and it's got so much detail on there um, that I could probably spend the rest of my life just trying to read all of it. But I'm not going to do that, and I'm very happy that Gonzalo is here to communicate some of those things and all the insights that are on there. So thank you, Gonzalo, and now I'll give the word to you. Thank you very much, uh, Marie, and uh, thank you again, uh, Liv, uh, for inviting me. Um, this is an extremely exciting initiative, so I'm really happy to be part of it. Um, the classical economics, of course, covers a large uh, is a large topic, and Hope to do it a little bit of justice um, and so we have a lot to cover and hopefully there might be some parts that I might skip uh, some parts I might have to rush through but hopefully we'll try to get it done uh, so the classical school if you're not familiar with it um, was the orthodoxy in economics between 1776 when Adam Smith wrote his Wealth of Nations and 1871 when there was what was called the marginalist revolution. Um, the classical school uh, goes by uh, several names. Uh, it's sometimes maybe the classical school, sometimes it's called the political economy school, but it, people call it the surplus school. At the time, it was, everybody liked to call it the British school in comparison with the American and the German and the French school. Uh, it's also widely known as the Ricardian School because Ricardia was one of the major articulators of the classical uh, uh, theory. The main classical economists are sort of listed below uh, and, and their, their major works. Um, you might have heard of some of them. So Adam Smith in 1776 with his Wealth of Nations. Thomas Robert Malthus uh, with his essay on population shortly after. Then David Ricardo with his monumental principles of political economy and taxation, which really brought the whole classical theory together. John Stuart Mill, um, which many of you have probably also heard of, uh, he put, restated the Ricardian theory, uh, classical theory in 1848. And Karl Marx, which I'm sure everybody's heard of, uh, who started off with the classical school, but took it in a different direction, but um, can be considered part of the classical school. I won't be covering Marx today because there's the Marxian, uh, I believe one of the uh, webinars is going to be covering the Marxian school, so that saves me a lot of time, but he should be seen as part of this tradition in the classical school. Now I mentioned 1871 as sort of the end date. Because in 1871, there was what was called the marginalist revolution, or, or sometimes called the marginal utility revolution. And um, that sort of ended the classical school, at least its dominance. And, and a new school emerged after, after more or less, after a few years, but especially after 1890, called the neoclassical school, which is a different theory and a different school of thought. And we're going to be comparing, and the neoclassical school is, of course, the one we're most familiar with today, uh, which is still dominant. Uh, so the conventional supply and demand uh, economics we're familiar with, that's neoclassical, not classical. Um, so one of the things I'm going to ask you as we're going forward is to keep the neoclassical, we're going to be comparing neoclassical and classical a little bit along the way, but to keep in mind that neoclassical does not yet exist when the classical school comes into being. So a lot of the things you might be familiar with were not familiar to the classical economists when they were writing. <clears throat> now, the classical school consists of many people. Uh, and I'm here, I've decided to do a quick uh, sort of uh, tree uh, 
And the historians of economics thought are divided of who should be included in the classical school. If we include everybody who was influenced by Smith, this is the entire picture. But there are some people who say that the classical school really is David Ricardo, or really starts from David Ricardo's works. And that's the purple subset. Okay. But people would, con would, wouldn't, would consider maybe Say or Jane Marsett influenced by Smith, but not exactly Ricardian. And so it's the purple part that people put a more narrow view of the classical school and say it's the part that stems from Ricardo's innovations on Smith. Other people say it's everybody who was influenced by Smith. So there are two, there's a narrow and a wider way of interpreting the classical school. Um, one thing I might want to point out is, of course, Piero Straffa, who's a part of the neo recording school, which is a 20th century school that emerged in the 60s, uh, which is a little outside the scope of the of, of our time frame. Okay, so let's start with then with Adam Smith and his wealth of nations. Uh, Adam Smith was a Scottish writer uh, living in Ed Edinburgh at the time. He was trained in Glasgow. Uh, and taught in Glasgow, uh, but spent a lot of his time in Edinburgh and wrote his book, Inquiry into the Nature and Causes of the Wealth of Nations, in 1776. Now, his question was very uh, relevant to sort of the Scottish situation at the time, where Scotland was changing a lot, and it had entered into a union with England. And there was questions about, you know, is Scotland going to become rich like England? Is it going to become poorer? So Smith was trying to understand, you know, what makes countries rich? And he's, he um, stumbled on this concept of the division of labor as key. And in his, he uses this analogy of, of a pin factory, um, which may, some of you probably have heard of, where he talks about an artisan trying to make pins by himself, and he may be able to do one or two pins a day because it's a very, even though it's a small object, it takes a lot of work. But if you divide the task of making the pin into separate parts, then, um, and you assign one worker for each part, a workshop can increase its, product, its labor productivity enormously. So if you think in, in a similar way that a factory, once it moves into an assembly line, uh, move, uh, you produce more per person than if every single person tried to produce a car by themselves on their entirety. But well, he really liked this insight, the division of labor in a factory increases labor productivity, increases output enormously. And he thought that that generally applies to society as well. We can talk about the division of labor in society in, this, in the same way, where people specialize in particular tasks or particular jobs. So become uh, bakers or become shoemaker, uh, uh, shoemakers or specialize in farming. And then they trade their product with other people. And you have the same result. If you have division of labor in society, labor productivity overall increases and national wealth increases. Now in a factory, the division of labor is organized by a manager. Who organizes the division of labor in society? Who tells you that you're going to be a baker, you're going to be a shoemaker, you're going to be a, a farmer? And this is where Smith moves uh, um, into his more ideological stage or his more famous stage, which says, you know what? Nobody does. It's an entirely spontaneous order. It automatically, everybody by their own self-interest specializes in jobs which they happen to be good at where they can make more earnings. And that automatically creates this division of labor in society. There's a famous quote he has that everybody loves quoting uh, from uh, at this stage in his argument. It's not from the benevolence of the butcher, the brewer, and the baker that we expect our dinner, but from their regard to their own interest. So that self-interest is driving uh, specialization, driving trade, and that increases the national wealth. Um, there is a cautionary element, of course. What enables you to specialize is the idea that, of course, you can exchange the product after it's finished. So Smith put this. Uh, or this limit that said that the, the extent of division of labor is limited by what he called the extent of market, which means the ability, where he meant the ability to exchange a product with somebody else. And if you expand the market, if you expand the scope of exchange, 
you will induce more specialization. And this was this part that comes into his trade theory, where he, talk, where he looks, saw countries in a similar manner that, uh, as individuals, uh, that if you open trade between, that countries by themselves try to produce everything, but if you open trade between countries, then they can specialize and there'll be more product overall. Again, from labor productivity and specialization. Um, now he talks a lot about exchange, um, which then brings up the question in his uh, in his first book, which okay, we talk about exchange, but at what ratio are things exchanged? I mean, how do you exchange? Uh, uh, how many shoes per bushels of wheat? How do you exchange fish for um, uh, beer or whatever you're making? And he starts thinking or starts asking the question, what determines prices? And the moment he asks this question about what determines prices, economic theory really starts. Uh, and, and, and he, so he is generally considered the father of economics precisely because of this, uh, of moving into this theoretical question of what determines prices. Now he thought prices, you know, vary all the time. They go up and down every day. And it's, it seems like it's pretty erratic. So he decided to divide prices into what he calls the market price and the natural price. The market price in his terms is a temporary price. It's, it's when you go out to the market, when you go out to the store and you, that's the price at the moment. And he called and he, that price, the temporary price or the market price as governed by supply and demand on the market at that moment. But then he poses this other thing, which is his natural price, which in his mind was the long run gravitational center where market prices tend to over time. Well, you can sort of see in that diagram that more or less the idea. So market prices go up and down, up and down, but they tend to you know, uh, orbit around this long run natural price. Now in his classical price, now he's got some classical price dynamics explaining what causes uh, market price to change. And, and these are basically driven by firms moving and switching sectors in the same way as people might switch specializations and, and uh, driven by essentially concerns of excess profits or looking for where the profits are. So for instance, if the market price is higher than the natural price in a particular sector, let's say in farming, then firms or capital will enter farming that will increase the output on farms and the market price for wheat goes down. If the market price is lower than the natural price, then firms will leave that sector, which will reduce the output in that sector and the market price comes back up. So this dynamic sort of sets, uh, this makes the system operate and the market price therefore converges to the natural price over time. Does this make sense? Okay, so time element is actually extremely important in this story. And, and I'm gonna spend one minute because it's, it's, it makes a huge distinction between the neoclassical and classical system. All the classical economists recognize that demand and supply exists in the short run or the short period. Uh, you can take the extremely short period or this market period uh, where supply of goods is immediately fixed and for the classical economists, you know, yes, in those situations, demand goes up and down and price is temporarily high and temporarily low. And then there's a short period uh, where supply of goods may be flexible, but factors are fixed. And this is your conventional neoclassical theory, where prices are determined by demand and supply. And that diagram, I think, should be familiar to everybody. And this is what's... Uh, this is what the neoclassicals hold as their essential uh, period of analysis. But for the long, for the new, for the classicals, there is this question, okay, so what if the supply of factors is flexible? What if the supply of labor and capital, all that's flexible in the long run? In which case the supply curve becomes completely flat. And if the supply curve becomes flat, and those movement of the de that demand curve back and forth has no influence on price. May influence quantity, but it has no influence on price. So if price is not determined by demand in the long period, then what determines price? And what determines this natural period? And this is where the classical answer was, 
cost of production. We're going to get to that right now. But before that, let me just uh, give you this little phrase, which I love from, from Schumpeter, which he always warns us when we're reading classical economics, to pay attention to the Ricardian vice. And he calls this vice as the tendency to ignore short run situations and think only in this long run format. So all the classical economists, they and demand, but they completely ignore it and hardly ever talk about it. They always tend to focus on this long period of when everything is flexible and, um, uh, and this may cause a disjuncture in, in, in how you normally think or a modern economists think because they're not used to thinking uh, in terms of, of uh, these extremely long periods. So what determines the natural price in the long run? Well, for Smith, it was the cost of production, which could be, for instance, the labor uh, embodied in, uh, in, in, uh, in production. He, in his uh, quote, the real price of everything, when everything really costs to someone who wants to acquire it, is the toil and trouble of acquiring it. So uh, as an example, if it takes two labor hours to hunt a deer, it takes one labor hour to hunt a rabbit, then the natural price of a deer is two rabbits. Now, it may be on the market at this moment, the price is different. It could be one deer is exchanging for one rabbit. But in that case, deer hunters would move out of making deer and go hunt rabbit instead in exchange for, at the better price. But doing that will increase the supply of rabbits and so therefore come back to the natural price. So that is his sort of analysis of why cost of production in his labor terms sort of centers or is the natural price around with market prices kind of center. He also talks about the water diamond paradox, which I just want to mention because classicals and neoclassicals have different answers for it. So the water diamond paradox is the idea that water, which is of course something that's very useful and essential for life, is very cheap, whereas diamonds, which are relatively useless, um, are nonetheless very expensive. The classical answer to this puzzle is that, of course, it, the reason diamonds are more expensive is because diamonds take a lot more labor hours to produce. Water is easy to fetch, relatively speaking. But the neoclassical answer is that diamonds are rare relative to desire. So they, em they emphasize scarcity and they emphasize subjectivity, uh, the, the desirability of the thing as well as its rarity. Whereas in the classicals, it's in a sort of an objective idea. It's objectively harder to produce diamonds. Now, it seems like two different answers to the same question, but at the same time, is it the same answer? Uh, a, a classical would answer a neoclassical at this point saying, well, diamonds are rare because diamonds are hard to produce. If they weren't hard to produce, they wouldn't be rare. So you're just sort of repeating the same point. And to say that it's relative to desirable, everything we're dealing with in economics is things that are desirable. We're dealing with diamonds and what? It, it doesn't affect, um, the, in their minds, didn't affect the, the proportions. And they can assume that everything was desirable, uh, at least when economics, is, if it's an economic object. Now, Smith comes up with his labor theory of value, uh, but then he gets a little confused. Uh, and the problem with Smith's confusion is that he ends up giving three theories of the natural and he, he can do that because he's the first guy to write about this, and so he's right to have not one theory, but three theories for the same thing. So he proposed that natural price was determined by labor embodied, other theory was that it determined by labor commanded, and then he had this crazy adding up theory later on in his book. Um, so Smith was relatively confused on, on exactly which theory he wanted, but Ricardo, who wrote in 1817, comes and settles on it's the labor theory of value, the embodied one, the, the first one, labor hours to hunt deer, labor hours to hunt rabbit, that's the one we should focus on. So if you read other series in Smith, it's because Smith is uh, he's in, he's trying to explain things and he's initially, and he has various theories that he's still playing with. So for Ricardo, only the labor theory, only the labor embodied theory of value makes sense. Smith's uh, work was extremely influential at the time, it's particularly in the 1780s. And he had, of course, some policy recommendations. Uh, the policy recommendations that come out of his book is essentially a system, what he calls a system of natural liberty, of laissez-faire, 
No government interference in market, that's just gonna distort where firms go in the searching of their profits, and that's going to distort things. He recommended free trade, and he rallied, railed against mercantilism in his book. With some exceptions, of course, uh, the government can get involved with public schools, infrastructure, and certain things that governments can do, but generally speaking, a very laissez-faire attitude, which is relatively rare for the time. And this sort of liberalism that he inaugurated was very influential in the 1780s. Uh, in Britain, in the US, and in France, there was people read Adam Smith in the 1780s, and when the revolutions happened, they started they integrated a lot of his ideas into sort of liberated markets, had free trade, and so on. But then everything changed in the 1790s. Because in the 1793, uh, Britain went to war with France, and this there was a very long, and this war continued for a very long time, for about 25, 22 years, quarter of a century. And during this period, there was complete trade blockades uh, um, between countries. Uh, there was hunger in Britain. Uh, uh, banknotes were suspended on convertibility. There was a period where they, Britain didn't have gold and just operated on paper money. Well, all, everything that Smith had talked about in 1776, particularly the trade thing, seems like a little bit irrelevant right now. You're talking about free trade, but we can't even have trade because everything's blockaded by you know, rival navies blockading our ships and ports. So everybody starts saying, well, Smith was just some guy back in Scotland in 1776. We don't really care about that anymore. We have to think of some excuse. And this is when the classical school really emerges. It emerges during this wartime period where everybody's sort of dismissing uh, Smith's lessons as sort of irrelevant to the new situation. And, and these guys try to restate Smith and rescue his lessons, saying, no, it's still important. And by revisiting Smith and re 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 restating Smith, they start developing uh, Smith's series in more precise forms. And so in the early 1800s, and you see, you see this small group of people, uh, Jean-Baptiste Say, Malthus, M James Mill, uh, David Ricardo, Robert Torrance, start developing the building blocks of what will become the classical theory of economics. Iron law of wages, the quantity theory of money, the differential theory of rent, the labor theory of value, comparative advantage in trade, and uh, Say's law of markets. I'm sure some of these you've heard of, and some of them you haven't, um, but these are all sort of camp comes out of this period very quickly. I'm only going to do a couple of them very quickly if I have time. The first is the just the iron law of wages and the differential theory of rent, because those may be uh, less familiar and they sort of underpin the entire system as, as the classical is constructed. The iron, iron law of wages comes out of the of, of controversy in the 1790s um, when there was hunger in England and the British government introduced basically a UBI system at the local government level uh, where they expanded welfare relief to everybody both the employed and the unemployed would get money uh, money uh, money allowances uh, that was scaled to the price of bread so that everybody would have a minimum level of income. And this guy, Thomas Robert Malthus, at that time was a reverend, uh, uh, a churchman, uh, basically wrote his essay on population saying that this is uh, self defeat, well, not only is it problematic, but self defeating. That poor relief, that increase in the incomes of the poor, would merely encourage the poor to have more children. And that this was a general rule that if you give incomes to people, that they will induce population growth, and that population growth will drag those incomes back down. But the poor are trapped in poverty, and there's no, and you can't really improve their situation except by moral restraint, or somehow getting them to voluntarily give up, you know, not have children in some way. How this fits into the classical theory, besides being a, a discussion of population, is that it gives us this iron law of wages, this idea of a subsistence natural wage. So this is this natural wage that Malthus talked about. There's a wage where every couple will have two children and no more. So the population reproduces itself exactly. If the, way, if the wage is higher than the subsistence wage and the birth rate will increase and the labor supply will increase and that will drive wages back down. If wages are below uh, the subsistence wage and the birth rate will decline, labor supply will decline, wages come back up. 
This is why it's called the iron law of wages, that market wages are always tending to in return to the natural wage in the long run. Again, this is the Ricardian vice to keep in the back of your mind, this tendency to always think in extremely long run, extremely long run way. So for a labor market, which you might in economics see this as upward sloping, uh, the classical economists saw it as a flat labor supply curve. The labor demand is for them was just capital uh, and that simply determined the scale. But the subsistence wage was given by biological biology and nature to be uh, a set amount. A second uh, basic uh, drive also uh, um, pillar of the classical economics was, as I mentioned, the differential theory of rent. This comes out of the corn law debates of the 1815. Uh, now, through the war, grain prices, wheat prices, were extremely high. And in 1815, as peace was arriving, there was this fear that once trade reopens, grain prices are going to come back down. And so landlords petitioned Parliament to pass a corn law bill. The Corn Law Bill was essentially protection for English agriculture that forbade the importation of grain into Britain, if, uh, unless the domestic, uh, if the domestic prices, unless the domestic prices higher than eighty shillings. So it's essentially it forbade the importation of grain. This provoked a lot of debate, and there's an interesting uh, phenomenon. And we sometimes talk about multiple scientific discoveries, and this actually happened in 1815 for economics. Malthus, in two essays, Edward West was, was a lawyer at the time, Robert Torrance and Ricardo, in the space of a few weeks, each published a separate pamphlet articulating the same theory of rent to try to explain why the Corn Laws were a bad idea. And their theory of rent was a, a tremendous change in how, something that Smith didn't think about at all. This is a, a, a new thing which becomes a very central block for the classical theory. So the theory of rent uh, is worth going through. I know it's, it's, it might take a, a couple of minutes extra, but it's worth going through uh, as, as it's kind of important. The idea of the theory of rent is that there are different fields. Now you can think of them as a diagram on the left, Q1, Q2, Q3, at three different farms. Each farm, let's suppose they hire the same amount of workers and pay the same wage bill. But the first farm is more fertile, the second farm is less fertile, and the third farm is, is the least fertile. So the first one produces a lot more surplus and the other one's less surplus. Um, for classical economists, and this is Ricardo and Malthus's point, uh, rent is a deduction by the landlords of the surplus. So when a landlord is looking at the situation of the three different fields, and he has three different farmers operating the fields, he will demand, so he will demand uh, he can replace, for instance, farmer three with farmer two, unless farmer two pays him a rent or a portion of that surplus. And if farmer two refuses, then he can just switch him with farmer three, because farmer three surplus is already very small. So the idea is that the landlords will force the equalization of profits across fields and extract rent from the remaining surpluses in between. Does this make sense? The landlord used rent to force equalization of profit rates across fields. The surplus on the marginal land, so the extreme land, the very last surplus determines the profit rate across everybody. And everything else is seized as rent. This has an implication, and the uh, important implication that if you expand cultivation, and this is a third diagram, if you expand cultivation to a fourth field, and the fourth field is going to be marginally worse. So it produces smaller profit, a smaller surplus. The landlords will use that smaller surplus to then force the rent to be even higher across the intermediary fields and force the profit rate to be lower across the board. So the expansion of cultivation uh, for, uh, for a classical school means that profits decrease all across uh, the fields and all across the economy and increases the share of rents overall. So this idea of protecting agriculture, like the Corn Laws are proposing, the Ricardians are like, no, that's all just basically trying to make rent income for landlords. It's actually going to hurt uh, uh, the, uh, profits, hurt the economy. It's, it's just a, a pure income scheme. 
When you put those two diagrams together that I just gave you, so the iron law of wages and the differential theory of rent, you get this diagram. I'm not going to go too much into it. This is just being stylized. Um, but so the point of product of land is that number two being empty Q. You got labor demand, labor supply determining the scale. That's Q, and that determines the profit rate when you bounce it on marginal product quantity, which determines the profit rate and determines, and the residual is the rents. Um, so what this gives you the basic tools, analytical tools of classical economics. The data is the technology, which is the marginal product of, of land, the subsistence wage, which is given by biology and nature, and this past capital that was there before. And from this, they can deduce the scale of production, the amount of rents, the amount of profits, and the amount of wages. So this is the core classical theory of production distribution. One point to note, simply because Ricardo always reiterates it, increasing in wages does not increase prices for the class. It just decreases profits. Never ever forget that when you play with the class. Wage increases, decreases profits. Now, Ricardo moved on to generalizing beyond. Uh, so this is a one sector model that he played with. Just, uh, wages, uh, sorry, everything was corn, everything was wheat. There was no other sectors. In 1817, he decided to expand, uh, he wrote his major work, which tried to generalize that pamphlet that he wrote and introduced various uh, new building blocks. And this is the really, the th theoretical core of the classical school. Um, there's not really much more to add here, except that he considers growth, uh, which he didn't consider before. Um, I'm not gonna go through the diagrams, but the basic argument is that only that in the society, only capitalists save, and they save from their profits. So that means the more more the, uh, profits there are, that means there's more capital, and if there's more capital, it means that there's going to be more employment. That's how he saw growth as. But because there's declining marginal productivity of land, as the scale of production increases, the profits become less and less and less. So again, that, that similar story, that, that profit becomes, so there's declining rates of profits over time, and that the economy will eventually approach what he calls a stationary state, where there's zero profit, no further accumulation, and growth stops. So this is a very dismal ending to the classical story. And he said there's basically only two, it's very, it's very hard to escape this. So he has this very dismal outlook, very pessimistic outlook at the end. Eventually, the economy is going to come to a grind to a halt. And the only way to avoid it grinding to a halt, one way he's saying is if you can somehow reduce wages. One way to reduce wages is to import food. So he develops a theory of comparative advantage, which you've all learned in your uh, basic economics classes. But his, uh, his point was that if you can import food that's cheaper, you can actually lower your wages and restore your profits a little bit and actually fend off the stationary state for a little while. He also talked about, hey, maybe technological change can also push out that frontier and, and push out stationary state further away. But in his third uh, edition of, of the principles, he actually reconsidered this. And this is when he was, this was at the high time where the Luddites were attacking machinery, is the beginning of industrialization in England. And there were uh, huge uh, arguments uh, going on in the countryside. Uh, that the machinery is displacing labor, and he considers the possibility that there might be permanent technological unemployment. And even though he recognizes that technology is changing people's productivity, he also recognizes that it can make permanent uh, unemployment, uh, unemployment they can't fix. He didn't come to a, to a conclusion on either case, he said just a possibility, and he left it at that. Um, so it's a, it just is an interesting innovation he adds into his third chapter, and of course we're still talking about automation and the impact of automation today, and also causing permanent unemployment. Ricardo died in 1823. There are still some problems with the LTV theory, which I didn't go into, and still he didn't solve the machinery problem. He was still thinking about it and considering possibilities. After he died, there was a, a bunch of Ricardians come in reiterating his message. Uh, these are a few of them, just names, some you might know, some you might never heard of. James Mill, Harriet Martineau, John Stuart Mill was the big, so that's the son of James Mill, so the big sort of 
a guy who comes in the middle and sort of does the textbook of, of the classical school in 1848. These there are very influential in the 19th century. Uh, these are just some of the acts, the Poor Law Reform Act, or the whole, the whole UBI system that they had and completely threw it out. Bank Reform Act, the gutter corn laws repealed, and there's a lot of Cobden Chevalier Tree in 1860, which sort of liberalized trade across Europe. The Cardians, this British school, were extremely influential in the 19th century. And they're extremely self-satisfied. There's a famous quote in Mill in 1848 that they thought they had it all solved. And he writes in 1848, happily there's nothing in the laws of value which remains for the present or any future writer to clear up. The theory of the subject is complete. Um, you basically asked me for trouble later. And of course, there, it wasn't complete. There was a revolution in 1871. And pioneered by these three fellows, uh, Jevons is British, Menger from Austria, and Valras uh, from France slash Switzerland, who challenged this whole, this whole theory and basically introduced neoclassical economics. So I just want to just quickly summarize, and I can't put all the details of the difference between classical and neoclassical. Some things are kind of superficial and obvious, like the fact that classical is always talked about in terms of classes, landlords, capitalists, workers, whereas neoclassical is always talked about individuals and, and they don't always differentiate between workers and, and capitalists. And so on. But that's just at the superficial level. At the core problem, the core difference is this theory of value. And the classicals have an objective theory of value. I believe it is in how things are. In the labor theory of value, it is intrinsic in, 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 the, in the goods. Whereas for neoclassical, it's a subjective value. Utility, it is opinion, desire, uh, becomes a huge factor, which the classicals sort of ignore. I mean, they accept it exists, but they don't make it as a determinant of value. Class, for classicals, causality goes from cost of production to price. For neoclassicals, you, did, you determine the cost of production, for instance, wages and, um, and profits and uh, wages and rents and so on, once you know the quantity price. So the causality is the opposite way. Factor demand in the classicals come from past capital. Factor demand in neoclassicals comes from current output. In classical, factor supplies are flexible. In neoclassical, factor supplies are extremely fixed. Uh, data. Their data, the initial data that they begin with is different. In the original data for the classicals, they need to know what the subsistence wage is, what technology is, and what the past capital is. For neoclassicals, they need to know what the provinces are, what technology is, and what endowments are. And this is, and when you do your modern neoclassical models, you always start with that profit preferences, technology, and endowment. Classicals would not do that. The dynamics are also different. Uh, the dynamics, uh, the price dynamics, it, for instance, we gave with Smith that price adjusts to excess profitability, firms moving between sectors. That's not really the price dynamics you have in neoclassical models. In neoclassical models, you have this auctioneer up in the air who sort of settled, adjusts prices in response to excess demand. In classical models, prices are, are adjust over time by uh, firms moving in and out of sectors. There's this parenthesis, which is, well, what causes quantity to adjust? And some neoclassical models have quantity adjusting to excess But then again, some classical models have quantity adjusting to excess demand. And here, this opening here of quantity adjusting to excess demand is where some people believe that classical and Keynesian economics can be reconciled. That the classical, which focuses a lot on the price side, doesn't have a quantity adjustment really properly written out, that Keynes can come in and fill in uh, the gap here. So there's been a lot of talk about merging the, the contributions of classical uh, and Keynesian economics. So this is obviously very different theories. Um, but then some people say maybe they're not different theories. And this is where Alfred Marshall, sort of one of the builders of the neoclassical school, actually said there was no revolution. It's easy to reconcile. The neoclassicals are correct in the short run. And the classicals are correct in the long run. Um, the only problem that the classicals had was this Ricardian vice of always thinking in the long run and never talking about the short run. That all the neoclassicals did was fill in the details of the short 
So that there is no revolution. It's all the same. Not everybody agrees on this, but that was his perspective um, uh, of, of, of how it's been. And the last thing I just want to mention, and I've run, I've, I'm pushing time, uh, was that there, there are modern schools that are, that are classical and uh, respect and draw a lot from the classical economics. Uh, Marxian school is the most obvious one of it all. all Marx starts with classical economics. It does take it in an interesting direction, but a slightly different direction, but it's still very much adhering to that objective theory of value uh, and uh, all those components of the Marxian school. But there are other 20th century schools that are also drawing a lot from classical economics. Uh, Kaletsky and the Kaletskians have a lot of that price dynamics that uh, is very similar to, to, to the classical dynamics. Vasily Leontiev and the input output models are classical, essentially classical models in, in, in inspiration derivation. But the most classically or closest to the classical is Piero Srafa and the Neo Ricardian school. Uh, which is started from the 1960s, and they're very much resurrecting uh, the Ricardian model and, and the Ricardian analysis, improving some things upon it. John Robinson and post Keynesians are also classical, can think of them as, as classically inspired. And her big project is, of course, to reconcile the classical theory of value and the Keynesian theory of quantity. And so you can, that you can bring both together, and that, in her mind, was the way to move forward. Um, and that's essentially what I've got. Thank you.